TV. My name is Anton. Okay, is provide a space for you can do to help build your. Tutor underprivileged students. You answer this question on the comment section of our social media account. And without further ado, to start tonight's event, I would like to invite our moderator for the night, the Amalina. Hi, Anson. That's to discuss tonight. I think because we're going to. Countries to talk about. Hello, everyone. I hope is out there. Happy Eid. My hometown is. I am the wife of Malaysia. I guess. Uh, come have any questions? Um, drop your questions. Um, obviously, you don't you're not here to listen to me, but rather, maybe we can start. Uh, I'm UA, I'm from. It's I was I was Boston lobster rolls almost Boston's home to to the Big that year. It's so amazing. Management. I think that workshop was probably pretty. I'm also program back in stuff. Favorite YCD moment? And 16. Currently, I'm working at YCD. And my wife back in. So a fellow Wesley fellow. That's really, really sweet. We can start with Masha, right? Um, what was your initiative like and how has it changed during the pandemic? Maybe okay. two slides. Yeah. 
I hope you guys. Yeah, the coffee. Seven hundred cases, uh, and since the lockdown, my office actually apply work from every day. But permission to initiate a few programs that can help people, uh, or at least mitigate the impact. we have done quite a lot two programs that I think it um, so, so uh, we hire, not hire, but we invite volunteers. They are students who are not able to uh, come back to their house due to the lockdown. So they stay in, in the city and we invite them to become a volunteer. We give them training for suing. And, and it's just like one day training. And finally, they could produce the mask. Up to now, we've, we have produced around 6,000 masks including 100 a clear mask uh, that we have distributed to the deaf community in, in the city. And this is the example how we use the, the clear mask. So the idea is very simple. If you, this is one example of clear mask. So we put a clear plastic in front of the mouth so the deaf people uh, can, can see it. So, so it's just very simple and yeah, I can actually keep doing this uh, by with uh, wearing mask and but uh, it is a pilot project and we're still working on improving the quality of the of the mask because sometimes it's not convenient for for the user because the plastic is very easily uh, unclear because of the breath. So we're currently working on. Uh, making more innovation towards the mask so it will be more comfortable for the deaf community to wear it and uh, to wear it every day to interact with other people. And other initiative, uh, so it aims to provide a food security to our community. So it aims to give a food security program to our community because there are so many logistics this has been distributed to families, but mostly it's rice and other staple food. So we kind of initiate to give them vegetables, but we want them to be empowered. So we only distribute uh, vegetable seed and give them a training or very short course on how to plant the seed, the vegetable. And after three months, together with all the community members, especially the local mothers, we harvest the vegetable, distribute them to, to those who are in need, and and so this, the community member can help each other by providing uh, foods to to the household uh, who are currently because many uh, people cannot go to work because of the pandemic and they stay at home. So this one project we organize it uh, in in several communities to help them to. To sustain their food consumption. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's two initiatives I think uh, very important in 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 my community because that's how we fight against the COVID pandemic and how we survive. Uh, because lots of 
initiative now are uh, going on, but we want to think inclusively by by also embracing the the deaf community, the local mothers, and also try to provide the a the needs of of those people. So as long as we are creative, I think we can find a solution, we can find something that we can do to help our community in order to survive during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I think that's all for now, Amal, back to you. Thanks so much, Rahman. That was amazing. I mean, I love the two initiatives that you guys are doing because it's, um, you know, on a grassroots level and it easily could be replicated in other countries as well. Thank you so much. That was really inspiring. Um, yeah, so maybe we can also go um, to the next speaker if uh, if we can have uh, you in. All right, let me just share my screen. All right, um, so I titled this uh, Building Trust and Resilience during um, what in Malaysia was called the Movement Control Order or MCO. Uh, maybe in other countries, uh, it was called lockdown. Um, so our MCO started on the 18th of March and we've gone through several phases. Uh, we are currently in our MCO, which is Recovery MCO. Uh, which is expected to last until the 31st of August 2020, uh, provided the numbers uh, stay stable or go down. Um, so during this period, um, I think, you know, the theme of our work uh, centered on three things. Uh, one, which is uh, identifying and serving underserved communities. Um, and why do I say underserved communities? Because in my constituency, uh, it's a very urban one, and it's also an old neighborhood. So uh, a lot of people think that uh, my constituency called Kampung Tungku is full of rich people. But uh, two years in the area has, uh, has actually shown me that there's a lot of uh, urban poverty. Um, so there are people who live in houses, big houses, but they don't have disposable income or their main breadwinner has either you know, passed away or left the family and they're struggling. So there's a lot of urban poverty. Uh, we have you know, unreported single mothers, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, etc. So, so uh, during the movement control order, it was uh, really important for our team to be able to detect these communities. Um, because in, in my constituency, so um, it's a bit gray. You know, we, we don't have areas where they look markedly poor. Um, so this was uh, one of the top things, uh, top uh, you know, challenges and also objectives of our team. Um, the second one was addressing urgent needs. I'm not sure whether this happened in Singapore and Indonesia, but uh, what happened to us in Malaysia was that um, we experienced a severe shortage of uh, masks and hand sanitizers. And a lot of times our frontliners were actually, uh, you know, forced to go to the front lines without masks and uh, proper protection. So this was something we focused on. And the last one was actually building trust and resilience. Um, to be frank, I mean, Malaysia did undergo a sudden change of government in February, right before the MCO kicked in. So as the current government was getting its feet on track, uh, there was a lot of confusion. So uh, we needed to tackle uh, things and tough topics like domestic violence, mental health, and job security during the MCO. Um, so what we did during uh, the MCO was my office launched um, two, at first we launched two types of aid, which was food aid, and then uh, aid for sanitary pads and baby diapers. So these were targeting poor families, uh, people with disabilities, senior citizens living alone and those facing job loss, salary cuts or food shortage. Um, after that, our state government came in to complement um, our aid schemes with baby milk and diapers. Um, so again, you know, it was just quite stunning to see that in, an, in a supposedly rich community, we actually got lots of requests for such aid. Um, the second part was, you know, addressing urgent needs. 
So one of our bigger campaigns was called uh, Help Our Heroes Fundraising Campaign or in Malay, Bantu Hero Kami. Um, so we actually helped a hospital out of state in another state to raise funds for ICU equipment. Uh, so we managed to raise about 42,000 uh, US dollars worth of equipment. Um, I'm happy to say that this month we completed all our deliveries. So they'll be more well equipped to fight COVID in the months to come if the numbers do come up. Um, and then we've been keeping in very close contact with our our policemen, our health department staff, and um, supplying them things like masks, face shields, and even simple things like you know tables and chairs for testing centers and fans so that it's not so hot in the testing area. Um, so these are some of our numbers. Uh, about 700 families received food aid. Uh, we gave out 193 packs of sanitary pads. It's a topic that sometimes you know people don't like to talk about, but I think it's important because uh, you know we don't we want women to be comfortable, uh, you know, in their natural state. Um, 50 families received baby milk and diapers. We gave out 15,000 face masks and about 600 hand sanitizers to frontliners. Um, some of the trends that we observed were that um, a majority of those who requested aid were women, almost 77 percent, um, and many blue collar and hard laborers are predominantly affected. So these are some of the jobs you can see, you know, uh, factory workers, lorry drivers, cleaners, small time traders, security guards. So these are, uh, you know, these are job sectors that we are monitoring um, to see if they need further help. So this comes to the last part, I guess, so building trust and resilience and how, you know, our activities have changed during the MCO. Um, during the days when we did not go out to distribute aid, um, I actually spent some time, you know, doing some videos. <laughs> so uh, one of them was on mental health tips during the MCO. And the second video, if you see in the middle, is about, you know, a little bit of a report of our first few distributions of food aid, you know, what I thought, etc. Um, what we've learned, which is really valuable, you know, from the MCO period is actually providing clear and consistent communication, you know, being a source, a trustworthy source of reference for information, but also encouraging fact checking. Um, at the same time, so among our residents, because a lot of times uh, people would come to us with very dubious uh, claims of like, you know, oh, ginger can, uh, can cure coronavirus, you know, uh, all this kind of uh, weird, weird little information. So if one person comes to us and asks us about, you know, all these dubious claims, it's manageable. But when 50 people come to us and ask us uh, several different questions, it, it goes a bit crazy. So. So uh, during this period, I think we also tried to teach our residents um, how to fact check and how to, you know, refer to proper sources for the latest health information. Um, also providing avenues to seek help. Um, I think, you know, coming from my particular political party, uh, we have previously struggled with, you know, establishing good relationships and trust with, uh, you know, certain civil uh, service bodies, for example, the police. Uh, so this period, I think um, we established ourselves as, you know, a good working partner where we were there to support them uh, whenever they needed uh, equipment or masks or even sometimes, you know, just uh, uh, simple things like paper or gloves for, for policemen. Um, and then the important thing now, which we are doing, uh, continuing from the MCO, is actually following up with issues. So in the last photo, uh, the man in the uniform is actually our, our district police chief. And I have recently just brought two women's NGOs to actually sit down with him and discuss, you know, what else can we do better in terms of uh, addressing issues such as domestic violence. Um, so I think, you know, the MCO has been a challenging period for us all, but uh, we are coming out, I think, a bit, you know, stronger and closer for it. So the important thing going forward is actually, you know, keeping vigilant, keeping our mask on and just making sure that all the work over the past three months hasn't been in vain. So that's it for me.
Thanks so much, Yiwei. Um, I love what you mentioned about mental health and domestic violence because um, sometimes those issues are getting overlooked at, um, but it's really important and it's a concerning issue. So thank you so much for that. And last but not least, Yoke, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Amal. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Uh, WINE is a non-profit that active in Indonesia, Cambodia, and Singapore. We've been active for about four years. Um, but we're still a team of only five staff, and uh, we're volunteers from these countries, as well as from the region and around the world. So we're a small outfit, and we do mainly community development, capacity building, behavior change, and such projects in these countries. Most of these were face to face. So when, when COVID, COVID started, obviously these projects were disrupted. But also because of COVID, our attentions then turned towards how the communities we were serving were affected and how we could best support our communities. So I'm going to tell you about two of the initiatives that we're focusing on. First, in Nagekeo in Flores, Indonesia, where we have staff based there. So around March, when COVID was sort of getting worse, our team in Nagekiwa, along with our local partner, Yasan Salmeri, um, initially we noticed that there was a lack of hand washing facilities. So we thought, well, since we um, work on water intensity issues, why not we provide hand washing facilities to um, the public market, um, bus stop, and even to the local hospital. So that's what we started with. And then through our conversations with uh, local health workers, we then noted that there was a lack of PPE uh, in the Puskesmas, uh, the health facilities, the hospitals. So we started procuring uh, PPE. We activated some volunteers in Indonesia, in Jakarta, in um, Central Indonesia to help us procure the PPE and then ship it over because we couldn't get them in Flores. And so a lot of our work has been focused on that because our frontliners um, in the area are really uh, lacking a lot of basic equipment to even be able to respond. And then as the, um, so the international community started recognizing how important masks were in preventing the spread of COVID, then we also reacted accordingly and but fabric um, hired uh, local sewers to produce the masks and then distribute them, them to resident um, people around. Yeah, so those are things that we have been doing and can see our efforts have evolved over the past four or five months. And then our next plans, um, we are working on working with YouTubers to produce messages to encourage people to continue practicing these um, safe distancing and, and hygiene efforts because you know by this time uh, a lot of fatigue has set in and uh, we're, we're become, many of us are, are become a bit more complacent so we're working on those messages to keep the community encouraged and help them you know, continue practicing these behaviors. So efforts have been mainly run by our small team of staff and our partners supported by volunteers but um, we couldn't have done this without the wider community actually stepping up and fundraising and donating to us. So we're very uh, lucky to have almost 100 donors contribute to this cause to allow us to do this work. And our work couldn't have been done without um, the wider community supporting us. So that's what we've been doing in Nagekeo in Indonesia. In Singapore, uh, the needs are very different, right? There isn't a lack of uh, PPE, for example, and the government is distributing masks to um, the population in general. So what we thought in Singapore we could thought was how we're thinking about how we could leverage our expertise that we've built in our organization. And what we came up with was um, we've been doing a lot of data change and research work. So but there isn't a lot of data available on, on people's behaviors in Singapore. We thought we could leverage our expertise to provide data and 
insights on what behaviors people are practicing and why they may or may not be practicing these behaviors. And our aim is to share this data to the public as well as to our partners to help inform their strategies. For example, what kind of messages should you be um, communicating? Should you be focusing on hand washing? Should you be focusing on wearing masks and so on? And one thing we did was we translated this survey to 13 other languages, so including um, Malay, Tamil, but also languages that uh, expats may speak Korean, Japanese, and also our migrant workers um, like Bengali and so on. So our aim was to really get a good picture of how people are behaving and use this data, leverage this data to help others, support others in their strategy and supporting their own community. So in order to do this, we didn't really have to mobilize funding because we're using our expertise. Instead, who we mobilized were volunteers, so volunteers to participate as survey respondents, to interview their friends, their family, um, mobilize a team of 70 plus translators to get the survey into the different languages. We are, have a partnerships team and public engagement team to, to engage organizations, to tell them about survey, um, share our results, to share our results with the public through social media and so on. So we're hoping that this will really help people understand what they can do as individuals in terms of how they behave to help prevent maybe a second wave or further waves from happening. So these are the two main efforts we've been focusing on. And what I'd like to highlight is that uh, with these two examples, how very different the projects are um, because of these different places, different contexts, and different needs. And what we've done as an organization was to try and recognize what these needs were, where we were present, and what our strengths were in those places to be able to evaluate the efforts. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yog. And I think it's really interesting because working in two different countries with really different needs, it's interesting on how you can uh, actually engage with different stakeholders and really understanding their needs. Um, I also love the fact that you are also very proactive in your efforts because you do prevention rather than cure. So that's a really uh, interesting insight. Um, okay, so I'm going to proceed with um, you know some questions uh, that I will uh, target to specific speakers. Um, but in the meantime, I would also like to remind um, all our audience out there, if you have any questions, do drop them in the comment section. Uh, the speakers are going to be very happy to answer your curious um, inquiries. So I'm going to start the, the first question with Rahman. Um, why is it important for you to help your community during the pandemic? I mean, you know, you said that you were bored, but why do you, what do you think that is important for us to help our community? Yes, thank you for the question, Amal. So finally, I found out that it's not merely about being bored at home. It's it's beyond that because I understand that this community needs to work together during this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think as part of society, everyone needs to make a contribution, even though it's, it's, it's only smart, a small, small contribution. Staying at home, uh, Wearing mask is a is a very big contribution to during this pandemic, and I think uh, we all need to support each other because today it's not only about us. I mean, it's not only about me as a person. It's it's about we as a community. It's, it's all about us because even though we are healthy, but our neighbor is sick, we are all still in danger. We are still in in a very critical situation. So we need to be okay, we need to be healthy together. Not only one individual is healthy, but another is not healthy. So this is what I think. So uh, that's why I think it's it's very important. And I'm also proud of my family because they let me go out and do something because I know it's very risky uh, working outside our, our home. But I always believe in my conviction that probably God protects me from COVID because, because he trusted me to be to be the one who, who can help other people who are in need. Yeah, that's what I think, Alma. Wonderful. Um, do any, uh, you for Yiwei, do you want to add to, um, 
you know, to the question. Do you guys have any extra insight that you would like to ask? All right, no worries then. So I'll proceed with the next question. So that goes to Yi Wei. Um, what has been the biggest challenge for you during the pandemic? I mean, you mentioned that you're doing a lot of things and I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of obstacles that you had to face. Would you mind sharing with us a few of them? Well, the first one uh, when MCO kicked in um, was definitely a lot of uh, confusion over over the guidelines. Um, so I'll give you one example of, of how, you know, the guidelines can be, can be quite silly. And uh, so I had a team member whose, whose wife uh, was she has to sit in the back seat and my Sorry, friend, Yiwei, I think you were breaking up a little bit. Would you mind just repeating a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier? What, uh, what, what did you lose me? Something about your husband. I mean, your your one of your colleagues. Yeah. So one of my team members was uh, fetching his wife to work, and they got stopped by a policeman, and the policeman said, "Oh no, she has to sit in the back seat." And then my friend said, yeah, but that's my wife. You know, I am going to go back with her at the end of the day. Uh, but the policeman wouldn't accept it. So, so there was a lot of confusion with the guidelines at the beginning of MCO. Um, it was, you know, difficult to, you know, planning how to move around. Uh, because on one hand, there is the message to stay at home, which we should follow. Uh, but on the other hand, there were a lot of people already, you know, writing to us for help, saying they did not have any food, you know, they needed baby milk, etc. So that was the first challenge. And then um, moving on, the second challenge would be, would be um, actually, you know, really just reconsidering how I function as, you know, a state representative, how I function as a politician, because we're so used to attending events, uh, you know, organizing events of our own, attending community events organized by communities, and suddenly everything has come to a halt. So it, you know, really made me reflect uh, as to, you know, how do I communicate with my constituents? That's the first thing. And what are my core duties, you know, my core responsibilities as, as an assembly woman? Um, so those were the two major challenges. And, uh, we've had to restructure our office quite a lot. So in terms of, you know, welcoming people, seating arrangements, etc. Uh, and also getting people to comply with these new arrangements. Thank you so much. Um, and last, I mean, and maybe the next question for you. Um, What's been, what, how has it been like for you during the pandemic? Uh, can you share with us a little bit about what uh, your new normal looks like? Thank you, Alok. Um, well, actually, I must say, um, I don't know whether you consider this lucky or not, but I would say there's not too much difference for us um, outside of the fact that our projects right now are different, and partly because um, we work in different countries, so we do work remotely a lot, right? Use online tools to communicate with each other. So in a sense, now we're just going even more remote. And um, really, we're already accustomed to working online. Um, but I, I would say what, what's different now, and that's linked to your question earlier about the biggest challenge, is that because as an organization, our basic duty is to take care of each other. And this pandemic, um, you know, looking at the findings on how much impact it can have for, on your health. Um, I, I personally, and I think our core team members as well, feel that responsibility to make sure that our, our team members don't get sick, right? Not only from COVID, but also from the stresses that come from being um, in this situation. And also trying to manage how you work and your personal life around those stresses, stresses is a very Challenging. So I guess that is a new normal. That's really true. Um, 
I guess that makes me quite curious. I mean, you know, you guys are the you know, your community leaders in your own way. Um, would you be sharing with us on, you know, I will be asking this individually, but how do you actually take care of yourself and to make sure that you guys are not um, being overwhelmed with um, all the hardship and all the obstacles that you guys had to face, especially during the pandemic? Would you guys mind sharing with us? Um, you want to start with you, Wendy? Oh, uh, I think you might get frozen there. Maybe yolk. Uh, oh, okay. You uh, Yes. Can you share with us how you take care of yourself without being super overwhelmed by the global pandemic, especially as a state assembly woman where you are needed everywhere, right? Uh, I think you know during the 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 stricter phases of uh, MCO. Um, I quickly learned that maybe working from home is is not that great because you need to have a certain sense of self discipline. So I ended up working longer hours when we weren't uh, giving aid. Yeah, um, I would you know just be in front of my computer and answering questions and you know looking up the SOPs. Uh, so so. That was the hard part, and and then I realized that you know my video about taking care about mental health also applied to me. Uh, things like you know, uh, because my parents live in another state, so things like 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 uh, understanding that you know social distancing, uh, doesn't mean emotional distancing. It's actually good to call in and talk to my parents every now and then. Uh, that was that was what helped uh, during that time. Um, otherwise, I think. It, you know, it was actually really helpful to have a supportive team. Um, although the burden was much heavier during the earlier parts of the MCO, uh, because and partly because we actually tried to scale the sorry, we I think we lost you again. Where do you lose me? Uh, you were saying something about scaling? Right. So we scaled down our team to a very bare minimum of uh, volunteers, um, which meant, you know, those who had senior citizens or very young children living at home, we said, you know, just, just take a break uh, for this time because we didn't want to put their family members at risk. Um, so although, you know, work was heavy, the team was much smaller, but uh, the team support also, you know, helped us uh, manage our emotions and, you know, navigate this pandemic together. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I love what you say about emotional distance. That's such a cool word. Um, so what about you, Rahmat? How do you take care of yourself? Especially because I know you had, you recently had a baby. Congratulations, by the way. But yeah, it must be really hard managing. <clears throat> yes, yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And I know I'm aware that I'm, in a risky situation because almost every day I have to go out and interact with many people, volunteers, community members, uh, many groups of people. So uh, the things that I uh, take care of in the first place is my mindset. I always put in my mind that I'm healthy, I'm stronger than the COVID. So I always believe in minds over matter. So when if you think positively that you are okay, I, I believe that your immune will be fine, your immune will be stronger than the COVID. And even though you have the COVID, you'll not be affected at that. But sometimes I sometimes I thought that oh probably I'm 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 I have a COVID, but it's not affected me. Uh, how do you call it? Orang tanpa gejala. But you know, like. Uh, there's always kind of thought, but uh, because I have a baby at home, whenever I come home, I I always have to take off my clothes in a garage and put them in the laundry and directly wash, uh, take a shower before uh, make interaction with my wife and my baby. So and I always consume vitamin. It's always in my bag. Always wear mask 
and hand sanitizer every time, wash hands, and those kind of things. I think it's very simple, but it's very important to do to to protect me. But the mindset should be should be in the first place. We need to fix it. Thanks so much. And last but not least, Yoke, how do you take care of yourself? Yeah. So, um, actually, uh, a few years ago, I did burn out and. After I burned out, I made one rule for myself is that I try to work 40 hours a week and I time myself. And if I go over time, I make sure I take that, that time later on. Um, obviously, when COVID started, that became quite impossible. So I've been clocking quite a lot of overtime hours, which I will claim back one day. Um, but yeah, during COVID, it did become overwhelming. And actually, I, I did do some something drastic. I, I dropped out of a part-time study that I was doing. I let go of an organization that I was working with, so I quit that organization. And although these were difficult decisions, I think it's also important for us to recognize that these are very challenging times for everyone. And it's okay to say that um, to give boundaries for ourselves, because there's no point if we fall down and collapse, but it's not going to be useful to anyone. And I think this is a principle we try to apply throughout our, our organization as well. Like, we don't force anyone to work. If we need to take time off, then we take the time off. Yeah, that is so true. And um, I came across this really awesome saying, saying that, you know, you can't give what you don't have, right? So if you are unable to have, the, I mean, if you are unable to, like, have a lot of energy for yourself, you won't be able to give that energy other people as well um so i will proceed with a question we actually have a question from one of our viewers from queen wong um addressed to yi wei but uh, i plan to also open this to other people but um the question is what advice do you have for local youth who are interested in joining open dating community efforts like those mentioned in your presentation i think yeah, you have done a lot of efforts. So how can um, how can the youth take part in your initiatives? <coughs> yeah, you did you share the question? I I missed the the question. Oh, okay. So basically, um, uh, she's uh, Queen Wong was saying that um. From your initiatives, how can they take part in it as Malaysian youth? Uh, well, the first thing is it depends uh, where uh, Queen is. Um, if she's in the Klang Valley, then we definitely uh, welcome you to get in touch. You know, either through through my Facebook page. Um, currently, we we aren't doing food distribution as much anymore. Yeah, Sorry, you're you're right. Right. Uh, we missed you at uh, you're not doing food contributions as much anymore. Yeah, we're not doing uh, food distributions as much anymore because um, the requests have slowed down. Um, but do get in touch with your local uh, state assemblyman, your local adun or local member of parliament uh, to see what you can help with. If you're around the Klang Valley, then uh, do get in touch with us through Facebook. Thanks so much. Um, so maybe the question that I have for uh, Rahmat and you is that um, how if, if the audience are inspired by um, this webinar and they wanted to take action and contribute in any way possible, can you um, give them advice on what can they do as individuals? Um, yeah, do you want uh, anyone of you want to take that? Okay, maybe I'll go. So. Um... If you're interested in volunteering with WISE, just contact us through our website or Facebook. We have um, lots of volunteers from around the world, so um, remote volunteering is definitely possible. I think if All you're right. looking, awesome. Pluck. If you're looking <laughs> uh, from Singapore, I can only speak for Singapore. Um, Giving.sg is a great um, platform where you can find opportunities. But I think um, in the context of COVID-19 in general, because many things are going remote. There are a lot of virtual volunteering opportunities that have been coming up as well. And one of the channels where we find a lot of um, valuable volunteers is 
this platform called onlinevolunteering.org. So do check it out. Um, another thing that I think we've observed in our local communities is that there are a lot of mutual aid efforts going around. So really just you know, uh, have a look around your community. Maybe there's an information board somewhere where you can find more information. Or just look out for your neighbour, right? And, uh, and your friends and see how you can support them. That's true. And sometimes, uh, you know, the solution or like, you know, how you can help others, is, it could be as easy as just staying home and wear a mask, you know. Um, and I just love what you meant um, by, I mean, what you said about uh, virtual volunteering and also uh, looking out for your neighbour because, oh, I mean, you know, everyone says that, right? So thank you so much. Um, Rahma, do you want to share with us on how um, individuals um, either in Indonesia or internationally, like what are your tips in helping to take action? Yeah, I think uh, during this pandemic, as long as you have inter internet connection, there's always a way to help uh, other people, even though you are far away from your uh, target group. Uh, but if you want, if you want to work with us at Dompet Uafa or the Boarding School, for sure, you just email me or DM me on Instagram. We can discuss it further and find out how you can contribute. And if you are especially in, live in Makassar, for sure we can meet up and discuss whether what we can do or I also can help set up a, a the plan for your organization. And we also can work together uh, to implement uh, programs like my organization does. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rahman. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. It's um, actually addressed to Yoke. Um, and this question is from uh, Rafi Vijatsono. Um, basically, he's asking, how do we maximize teamwork with our organization, our community, or team while we are at home or maybe in different countries? I think because we have a lot of experience in like, you know, working remotely uh, across the region. Um, do you have any tips for the audience out there? Okay, Rafi, thanks for that question. Um, and it's not an easy question to answer. I think I could go for days on the different things that we've tried. Um, and some work better, some work, um, some work less well. Um, but I think what is important to recognize is that everyone has a different working style. Um, and everyone um, works best under different kinds of positions, uh, under kind of different kinds of circumstances, or even just we have people on our team, some are early birds, some are night owls, so we're all working at different times. And what we then try to do is uh, create platforms that allow people to operate um, at their best. So tools that we currently use are Slack to communicate with each other. Um, we, we one, I think one thing we do that's also important is we have team members who only focus on volunteer engagement, so whose task is to check in with people, make sure they're active. If they're not active, uh, check in individually to find out how they are, right? Because we, we might just be struggling uh, personally. And what I think is really important, really to maximize that teamwork. It's not really about teamwork, it's just caring about each other and making sure that we are doing well in our lives. Because if we're not doing well, it doesn't. What we're supposed to be helping out with our work is it's not going to happen. And that's, I think, the basic principle of teamwork and engaging each other is caring for each other uh, on a basic level. All right. Um, okay. So I see that the questions are coming in. So please keep them. You know, please keep them coming. We love questions. Um, the next question is actually uh, addressed. To Rahmat from Putra, how is it, I mean, um, tackling the pandemic in the midst of natural disasters at the same time? Uh, so you're from South Sulawesi, and um, they're saying that how do you actually uh, handle two pandemic, I mean, two issues at one time? One is natural disaster, and the other one is a global health pandemic. Could you share with us? Yes, it's a very difficult situation here in, in South Sulawesi because we, we just had a severe uh, flood that killed like 
many people. And there's about three, uh, 107, 1,700 1, people uh, currently live in a shelter uh, up in the mountain without any proper a facility and infrastructure. Uh, in, in the first days of the disaster, it's very, you know, like everyone was very, uh, how to say, everyone was, was panicked because it's never happened like that. The flood brought a materials from the mountain and it's up to two, meter, two meters, uh, uh, rocks, uh, soil. And I, I remember on the first day I got into the, the affected area, everyone didn't wear mask or everyone forgot that there's COVID or we, we live in a pandemic at the moment. And I think it's, it's very understandable because everyone was in shock. And just like a few days after, uh, I and my organization, Don Petu Alpha, now try to smoothly campaign and remind everyone again that we are still in the pandemic. And we distributed a mask and also we now we start building a uh, water facilities and also wash program. Uh, I just, uh, your presentation just remind me that we're also building that at the moment so people can have uh, access to water in order they can wash their hands every time. So probably I need to talk to your after this, probably we can work together to provide wash facilities in, in the affected area. So yeah, it's very difficult, uh, but we're trying our best to keep reminding everyone that we still need to wear masks, even though now they are in a difficult situation, but we're trying our best to always provide them with masks, uh, uh, wash uh, facilities, uh, and etc. All right, thank you so much, Rahmat. Um, so we have another question from Shannon COVID. And um, the question is, during the pandemic, what's the best way to engage with the community to understand their needs, especially the underprivileged community? Would you mind if I ask Yiwei on this? Because you were talking about understanding the needs of the community earlier. Do you want to take that away, Yiwei? Sorry, Sorry. I forgot to unmute. <laughs> Oops. Okay. That that's one of the challenges, right? In COVID, you know, you forget to unmute and, and stuff. But um I think one of the first steps is uh just having, you know, a customer service or, or a feedback team that is uh, you know, quite quite supportive and empathetic. Um so when people ask us for help. I had two, two or three staffers, um, you know, receiving calls and SMSs uh, for food and, you know, baby diapers. So it was important for us to, to be very understanding uh, while trying to uh, obtain as much information as possible about their background. Um, you know, understanding that, that uh, they might be reluctant to actually ask for help. Um, we were a bit limited in the sense that usually when when a residents approach us for for aid, usually our response during non COVID seasons would be to go uh, and have a house visit, but during the stricter parts of the lockdown, that was not possible. So it involved a lot of you know, talking on the phone and a lot of uh, gentle follow up um, so that we, we could, you know, really understand uh, people's needs. And sometimes they would call about, you know, food aid, but then it would turn out that, oh, they also needed a wheelchair or maybe some walking aid or adult diapers for a senior citizen living in the house. So we had to do a lot of, you know, slow, gentle talking and also um, understanding what other agencies were providing uh, to them. So for example, in my constituency, there are actually a good population of Indonesians living there. Um, 
So the Indonesian embassy uh, was good to come over and they gave uh, food uh, to each of the families from time to time. Uh, you, are you still there? Again? Oh, sorry. I think we uh, you got a bit cut off um, when you were talking about the embassy. Right. So the embassy would come and uh, provide food for the Indonesians living in my constituency. Uh, so once we knew that the embassy was making their rounds, uh, providing food, uh, we actually also... Uh, you know, reach out to those Indonesians to let them know that, hey, you know, we have other things uh, such as milk and pampers for, for the kids. Do you need that? And uh, they were quite happy that we asked, you know, because it was something that they didn't think that, you know, someone from the government would help provide for them. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're getting a lot of questions now. So I'm going to take one last question. Uh, if that's okay. Um, this is addressed to you um, from Zara Audia. Uh, when building a community, how do you manage the time to meet with different time zones, for example? How do you overcome or anticipate cultural differences that might influence community decisions? Especially because when you were talking about Indonesia, Cambodia, and Singapore, these, um, you know, these countries have different cultures. So how do you actually manage that? Uh, thanks. Zara, um, with the first question um, across time zones, so I mean, actually, mostly we work in Southeast Asia, so our time zones are similar, but we also do have volunteers from as far away as the US, so we have to adjust accordingly. I think um, for us, it's, we try to be as accommodating and understanding as we can, and we use tools like a Doodle or WhenToMeet.com to figure out what is the time that um, best suits everyone. Um, but I think another thing we can do is, you know, if we don't need a meeting, then there are other ways to communicate, maybe just um, chatting with each other, which doesn't require us to be online at the same time. Um, with cultural differences, yes, I think that that's difficult. I think the, the first thing is we, everyone there has to understand that uh, we do have different perspectives and views that might not align each other and to come in with that open mind. I think that's first. And second, I think it's important for whoever is um, coordinating or moderating that discussion to ensure that everyone has the space to speak and to provide a safe environment for them to speak out. So recently, uh, we had a meeting a few days ago. So, and um, I happened to be moderating it and I found that people were not some people were not contributing as much. So one thing I tried was just to message them personally to ask, you know, was there anything they wanted to share that perhaps they were not so comfortable sharing out to the group? Maybe they could share um, directly with, with us and, and then I could help uh, float it up anonymously. So that's one thing I tried. And then another thing is after that meeting, then we, uh, my colleague created a Google form, an anonymous form, right, to collect more input after the meeting. So that also gives an opportunity for people who are less comfortable in a discussion um, meeting space to uh, air their views in a different platform. Thanks so much, Yoke. Um, I think this, uh, those are all the questions that we have today. And, you know, we're heading towards the end of the webinar. And um, pre uh, before we uh, conclude, maybe I can give some recap points that I think would be quite relevant for those um, audience out there. Um, I, we have learned a lot from uh, our community leaders on helping the community from different levels. So, Rama, you're working on a grassroots level, helping the community itself with, um, you know, with uh, food and masks, and you were on a state level and you're on a regional level. Um, I think, uh, personally, I, am, uh, I resonate a lot uh, with each of you guys and what you guys are saying and Rahmat you were saying that it's not about me but it's about we and how we have to take care of each other in order for us to um, prosper as a community and Yiwei you also talked about reflecting our function in the community as I mean what is our role in the society now um, that COVID has happened it makes us wake up 
And um, you, you also talked about setting boundaries and taking care of yourself. And I think that's really important. Um, I guess in conclusion, I could say that, you know, COVID is a great wake up call and it's important for us to not just take care of our health, but also our mental well-being and um, also our community as a whole in order for us to um, hopefully get out of this uh, global pandemic as a better community. So without further ado, I guess I'll get back to Anton and yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much for our moderators and also our speakers tonight for the very wonderful discussion. And earlier in the event, I asked you guys an icebreaker question. I'll repeat that question one more time. The following are things you can do to help build your local community during the COVID-19 pandemic, except A, give blood, B, tutor underprivileged students online, C, stockpile as much food as you can, or D, donate to a food bank. And the answer is C, stockpile as much food as you can. And the winner for tonight's quiz is at pepperoni pizza from Instagram. Congratulations. And now you might be wondering, how can you develop an awesome idea for a place like this? Well, wonder no more. You can come straight to our website at www.atamerica.or.id. You can come to click create an event and then collaborate with us. And then you can submit your proposal there. All of the proposals will be reviewed and your event might just end up here very soon. And while you're on our website, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter for more information about our upcoming events sent straight to your inbox. Well, it has been fun, folks. Uh, don't forget to tune into our next episode. And also, don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. We hope to see you again at the next Ad America TV event. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>